Truly all praise is Allah's. We praise Him, seek His assistance, and ask His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and our bad actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can turn astray, and whomsoever He turns away, has none to guide Him. I bear witness there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. To Him belongs all power and all praise. I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's servant and final messenger. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, his family, his companions, and those who follow in righteousness till the end of time. Allah says in his book, the meaning and translation of which is, O you who believe, be in awe of Allah as his awesomeness demands, and do not let yourselves die except that you are Muslim. O humanity, be in awe of your Lord who created you from one soul and from it its mate, and spread forth from those two many men and many women. Be in awe of Allah by whom you ask of one another, and as such to the wounds that bore you. Indeed, Allah is ever watchful over you. For today's khutbah, I began by thinking about something that's always interested to me. It's the way in which people live their lives, and the way in which people's lives come to an end. And something that has always fascinated me, uh, that I think is both edifying and a little bit, at times, even terrifying, is that people's lives can change tremendously and sometimes apparently for no clear reason. So two people can come from very similar circumstances, have similar personalities, and live in a similar kind of milieu and yet they end up at a different point at the end of their lives. Some people you see, they grow up very pious, very connected to their religion, and something happens, whether gradually or abruptly, and it turns them away from their religion and they end their life in that state. Some people, on the other hand, will live their lives apparently entirely heedless of religion and faith, and something will happen in their life, perhaps at the end of their life, that turns them towards Allah, and that is how they end their life. And it is, to me, always fascinating that we exist as Muslims in this state of constant tension, that we don't know what we are going to be, or if we will even be in the days to come. We don't know how we will approach the world and what our relationship with Allah will be in even a week from now. Perhaps something will happen that will turn us away, or perhaps something will happen that will bring us closer to Him. And so I've been thinking a long time about what it is that might help us understand this. And I found an analogy in something through medicine, actually which is good because I don't study medicine, much to the chagrin of my family, but that's okay. There are two kinds of pain. What some psychologists or therapists or doctors will call integrative pain, and the second type is what is called disintegrative pain. Pain that is integrative is pain that builds yourself and contributes to your sense of who you are. Pain that is disintegrative does exactly the opposite. It wears you down, it wipes you out, it breaks you apart, it fragments you, it fractures you, it dissolves you. And I'm not talking about the physical pain, or only the physical pain, but what's going on in your mind and your heart. Because sometimes we put ourselves in painful situations and it feels good and we do it on purpose. So if you go to the gym and you work out, when you're done, your body will hurt, assuming that you did it, you know, that you worked out as much as you should have. But even though your body hurts, you feel good about it. Because you tell yourself, I went to the gym, I have a regimen, I do this every other day, every week, whatever it may be, and I'm doing something positive for myself. So yeah, my arms hurt, my legs hurt, but it's a good kind of hurt. Or if you spend the whole day in the library and you go brain dead after 10 hours because you just can't absorb any more information, and the last thing you want to do is look at another book, but it's a good kind of pain, it's a good kind of tiredness, because you did what you set out to do, you studied, you did your homework, you prepared for an exam. But there are other kinds of pain which do the opposite to us. Sometimes this is the kind of pain that affects us physically that doesn't seem to have a cause. So you get afflicted by an illness, you face some kind of life situation, you can't find a job, someone you love is going through some kind of trauma, and it doesn't have a clear resolution. If you break your leg, there's a set of steps that you will take or someone will take for you and it will fix the problem. If someone says to you, eight weeks you can't walk, you might be okay with that because you'll say to yourself, alright, I know how to solve this problem. It's eight weeks and I'll be okay. But sometimes we get faced by things in our lives, physically or spiritually or mentally, that don't seem to have that kind of easy solution. And that's when 
you get this kind of response of, why am I suffering? What is wrong with me? Why is this happening to me? How come I can't figure out how to solve this? How come I can't figure out how to end this? I'm just like everybody else, but for some reason bad things are happening to me. Someone else went to the same school I did, got the same grades, had the same major, looked they have a great job, and I'm still looking for a job. What is wrong with me? And very quickly that becomes, why is God angry with me? Or why is God upset with me? And I think one of the reasons in which people's hearts shift so quickly is because of the story they tell themselves about what is happening. What we tell ourselves is happening to us. So, I began to think about the ways in which Muslims explain things that are happening. And now, what I want to do is not talk about individual pain or individual suffering, but in the collective, in what happens to people en masse, as a group. And many times you hear people will say things, you know, if Islam is so great, if Islam is the truth, then why do countries where the population is majority Muslim have so many problems? How do you square those things? And for people who are Muslim personally, that becomes a problem too. Why is it that people who follow my religion in so many parts of the world have so many problems? And one of the answers that I've heard to this recently, and it, it's really bothered me because I've been thinking about it more and more and the implications of the answer, is that it's happening because we're being punished. It's tied to what I would call a triumphalist narrative of Islam. Where anything, that bad, anything bad that happens to us as Muslims, wherever we are in the world, is for only one reason, and that is because we are bad Muslims and Allah is punishing us. And so the way in which the question is answered makes you feel that you are at fault, that you have done something wrong, and eventually that you yourself are so bad that there's nothing you can do to fix it. Because the scale of the problem, the type of the problems, are so long in duration that they can't be solved easily. It's not like a simple illness or a simple exam or a course or something like that. You simply can't break it down easily. Now, I want us to think about some things when it comes to this story that people tell. The first is how easy it is for some Muslims to assume that other people are bad Muslims. And that whatever is happening to them is because they deserve it, because they have been unfaithful to Allah, and they have not followed out Islam as it is intended to be. Secondly, what this says about how we know what Allah's intentions are, and how we know what is in the condition of other people's hearts. And thirdly, that we assume that things in the world have such simple causes and such simple effects. Now, understand me very carefully, I'm not saying that the way in which you practice your religion doesn't have consequences for you in this world. Islam can and will, if followed properly, make you and the world around you better. But that does not therefore guarantee that just because you are being faithful to the religion, that everything will work out perfectly for you. In fact, the contrary. That when a person makes a commitment to Islam, when you resolve to do more, to become a better Muslim or more practicing Muslim, then Allah will almost invariably throw something your way to test your faith. Are you being serious? Or is this just something you're saying to yourself to make yourself feel better? What is the purpose of your faith and your relationship to God? Is it to achieve a worldly end or an otherworldly end? Because if the reason you're doing things is simply for this world, then you're not doing it for the right reason. And a lot of times when Muslims tell their history, or teach their history, or share their history, we have this very simplistic story that goes something like this. Everything was great, and we were all wealthy and cool, and people wanted to be like us. And then the Mongols came, and then everyone was a bad Muslim. And everyone's been a bad Muslim for 750 years. And that's why everything's so bad. Some people will choose a different date, to their credit. You know, maybe it was in the 1600s, maybe it was in the 1700s. But the fact of the matter is that somehow, somewhere, everything apparently went wrong. Everyone's a bad Muslim. And that's why these things are happening. So rather than direct the attention to ourselves, we are directing it to others. And we also don't think about the ways in which how we understand our history speak to our religion. I'll give you an example. Allah has taken it upon Himself to guarantee that the Qur'an will be unchanged, that not a letter of it will be altered. 
that it is as it was revealed and shall be throughout time. Now some people will say that some decades after the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him passed away, there was all this fitna in the community. There were revolts, there were ugly incidents, there were bad leaders, things happened. Not very pretty things. Yet perhaps the way in which Allah chose to preserve the Qur'an, because it is in His wisdom to do as He sees fit, was through this fitna. Because there was no one central authority that everyone could agree on, nobody had the ability to tamper with the Qur'an. Nobody could touch the sources of Islam. Now, if we have a very simple reading of history, we will deny ourselves that. And in the second part of the khutbah, and again I'm setting records for fastest first parts of khutbahs, um, but in the second part of the khutbah, you'll only get that if you're here for eight. Uh, in the second part of the khutbah, I will talk a little bit about what this means for us personally. About how we can apply this positively to ourselves, and how we can affect our Islam, and the way in which we live and improve our Islam. أَقُولُ مَا تَسْمَعُونَ وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَائِرِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ ذَمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ I say what you hear, I ask forgiveness for you, for, my, uh, for myself, for you, and for all those who believe. Seek forgiveness from Allah, for He loves to forgive and forgives most often. All praises to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and prayers and peace upon the best of men, our example, Muhammad. I will give you a hypothetical. Let us say that I am NYU, and I embody the entire institution in myself. And you are uh, the United Muslim Association, the Ummah here on campus. And I say to you, next year you can have $20,000. That's your budget. I don't know if that's really your budget, but, you know, bear with me. If it's not, I apologize. Maybe it's something to aspire to, or something to be embarrassed of. I have no idea. It was a lot lower when I was here. Now, maybe the shura, the board, will sit down and say, how do we want to spend this money? And some people might say, I think that we should concentrate on the people who come here every day, and we should put this money to work for them. And perhaps some will say, no, I think that we should spend the money on reaching more people, more Muslims and bringing them here and giving them a space where they can pray. And maybe some could say, you know, I think we should spend more of our money and more of our energy on improving the image of Islam. Because right now this is a very negative thing going on. So why don't we put our energy, our resources towards that and orient our year towards that. And let's say out of these three choices, they choose one. And at the end of the year, they do a review and they say, you know, it didn't work out the way that we thought it did or that we thought it would or it should. Now if you hold this simplistic reading, you will assume that everything went wrong or that it didn't work out as it should have because everyone was a bad Muslim. This conversation, this reading of history is often or most often used to put an end to any kind of debate or discussion in our communities. So rather than think openly and honestly and have conversations directly and forthrightly about what we can be doing, what we should be doing, what we've done wrong, where we can improve, this puts an end to everything. Because it's as if someone is telling you, no, all your ideas are useless, it's just because somebody's a bad Muslim and that's it. And it's used in a way to close the conversation and the conversation. And for a lot of people, this leads to the kind of disintegrative pain I was talking about before. Because they have no way to articulate what they're feeling, they have no way to articulate what's wrong with them, and so their image of Islam and their understanding of their relationship to God falls apart. And this is why you see many times in people's lives they can have apparently a very strong practice of Islam and something happens to them whether you can see it or not and then within a few weeks or months they're a completely different person. Because they can't reconcile what has happened to them with their religion. They can't figure out what the purpose or relevance of what is happening to them is. And so I will make a couple points here. The first is that if you tell someone that anything that is happening to them that is bad, that is negative, is because they have failed as Muslims, then you will probably lead them in one of several directions. Either they will become so consumed 
by the practice of Islam that their entire focus of their ibadah will be to lifting their circumstance. And if it doesn't work, then they will assume that the ibadah doesn't work. I prayed for five years for Allah to fix this problem, it wasn't fixed, therefore he's not listening to me, therefore what's the point? Why should I pray? You hear this very often. Or people will become very arrogant and assume that it is the deficiencies of others that are causing the negative circumstance and then they turn into people who hate the people around them, who judge or look down on the people around them. And this is a very common thing. People get so wrapped up in one idea or one image of what their religion is supposed to be that when something different happens, something new happens, they don't know why it happened and it all falls apart. Do you know why Darwin put an end to, at least in many circles, a certain vision of how the world works? It wasn't evolution. It was something different. Many people in the 1700s in Western Europe and the United States, they came to believe in this idea of a watchmaker God. You've probably heard of this, right? God makes this beautiful, perfect universe, sets it in motion, and then removes himself from it. And they believed that through their reason they could figure everything out, they could fit all the pieces together, and this was ultimately because the universe was benign, it was mechanical, it was simple. And Darwin came along and his idea, his image, was that no, the universe is full of struggle. The only way in which life progresses, in his view, was because animals, different species, are struggling all the time. They kill each other for resources, and the ones with the best traits, the most fit, those are the ones that survive. So suddenly it introduced this very negative image of what the world was like. There was pain and there was suffering, and this is how life worked. And for a lot of people, they couldn't reconcile the two, and it fell apart, and they found themselves embarrassed to even hold religious beliefs. So you find in many academic settings, you talk to people, and if you talk about religion, they become really uncomfortable, as if it's something for people who are not very intelligent. Because they got so wedded to one view of what things are. The second point that's very important here is that when something happens to you, it's an opportunity. It may well be that Allah is bringing something negative on you, something hard on you, but it is not in our interest to see it merely as a punishment, but as a gesture of mercy. Because there is such a thing as tough love. Right? You ever have like a nephew or a niece and you want to just give them whatever they want and their parents are like, no, stop spoiling them. Or their parents are like, no, you can't have chocolate. And then their grandparents show up and like buy them the whole like aisle in Walgreens because they just don't want to like say no because it's, they don't have that relationship. And parents will say to their children, even if their children are crying and whimpering and whining, no, 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 you, you can't do that. There is such a thing as tough love. When something happens to you, when anything happens to you, see it as an opportunity not only for reflection, but for improvement. There is really nothing, like when you get the chance to pray late at night, when you are hurting, and you are literally, metaphysically, physically alone with your Creator. And you have that connection. Many times the things that seem negative to people are the only things that, because of our arrogance or stubbornness, bring us closer to Allah. So rather than see it as Allah is punishing me or angry with me, it may very well be the case that Allah wants more of you and expects more of you, and He is doing this to jolt you out of your complacency. The people who were most tested of all were who? The prophets. Peace be upon them. They were the most tested. And yet, what were the prophets known as? Khalilullah, the friend of Allah, Ibrahim. Habibullah, the beloved of Allah, Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon both of them. And yet, they were tried day in and day out. The trial itself was an indication of God's love for them. And those who were left untried, it was as if God didn't care about them. That they had become so arrogant, so stubborn, that they had simply left the path. We should be very careful of assuming that if everything is going well, that that means that we are good people. And we should equally be very careful not to assume that if things are going badly, that it is because Allah is angry with us, or Allah wants bad for us. 
And here is where the most fascinating tension in Islam lies. And by tension, I mean something positive. Because Islam is not a religion of complacency. You can't just cruise through it. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is recorded as saying that for every disease except death, there is a cure. He is also as recorded as saying many times that to the effect of if anyone lifts the burden off of a believer, off of a Muslim, then that person will be rewarded for it. He has said on other occasions that there is a reward for the person who points to good as much as the person who enables the good. In Bukhari, he mentions an incident in which a man was walking along a path and he stepped on some kind of thorn plant. The first time I told the story, I forgot to mention that it was on a path. So everybody was looking at me like, why is this man stepping on a thorn plant? So let me underline that the man is walking along the path. And he steps on a thorn plant, it pricks him, it hurts him, and he removes it out of the way with this intention that I don't want anyone to ever be hurt by this again. And the narration of the hadith is that, and for that he was forgiven. So on the one hand, we must understand that things will come our way that we may not be able to change. Trials and suffering and difficulties that may last even generations. But on the other hand, we must understand that it is our obligation as Muslims to do whatever we can to remove the burdens off of others. Because this is the character of those who are beloved to Allah. And this means that rather than see people who are suffering and assume that they are being punished, Perhaps we should assume that this is also an opportunity for us to do something. To give our lives purpose and meaningfulness. Because really, do we ever stop and think to ourselves why we do what we do? And what the point of it is? I was reading a, a really interesting book by a philosopher who is not a Muslim, and he was talking about issues around anxiety. It was a very fascinating thing, because he uses a lot of pictures, and I like books with pictures in them, so I just admitted it. But he did something really interesting. He showed a picture of a, of a business conference from 1902 with a bunch of salesmen for Heinz. You know Heinz, like the ketchup company, 57 varieties, right? Um, if I can ask people to move up, because we do have some people standing, so if we're able to move up a little bit. If you have to lean for any physical reasons or anything, it's fine, but if you can move up, it would be appreciated. So he shows this picture, it's a black and white picture, 1902. It's, I don't know, dozens, hundreds of men working for Heinz, they're salesmen. And you can see in their faces this kind of uniform ambition and aspiration. They're all wearing suits. Back in the day, everyone kind of tended to dress very similar to each other. You know, They're all wearing the same kind of tie or bow tie. And they're sitting at tables, banquet style, and they just look ready to take on the world. Like they're going to sell ketchup. They're going to sell a lot of ketchup. And people are going to buy ketchup from them. And it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and he said to them, you know, he said in the book, he said, look at their faces. They're all gone. They're not here anymore. All their ambition, all their dreams and hopes are no longer dreams and hopes. Because everybody passes on. And this is not to say that we should not have ambition. We shouldn't work hard or that it is bad to work for a ketchup company. I really hope nobody here works for Heinz, but if you do, we can talk later about bulk purchases. But, really, think about this. When you look at your life, how do you want it to be? How do you want it to end? What does it mean? And in the very mundane things we do day in and day out that seem to be so boring and not interesting and we would rather our lives be very cool like an adventure movie where you know there's no boring events, there's nothing stupid or silly, you don't have to go to the post office to mail something out of your way and screw up your day. But it is the very mundane things that give us the opportunity to come closer to Allah. Because all those moments are filled with meaningfulness. When we work to provide for ourselves and our families. When we spend extra time with our loved ones. When we give of our time for positive causes. And we should see, inshallah, that the story we have inside of ourselves, the image we have of Islam, the belief we have of what Islam is supposed to do for us, should be something that does not close off opportunities. That does not tell people that if something is happening to them that is difficult or hard, it is because they are fundamentally at fault. But rather that we should lift ourselves up. On one occasion the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him saw his companions and they were laughing or, or 
just kind of chilling. I don't know, they were having a good time. They were being very lighthearted. And he said to them, if you have seen what I have seen, you would laugh very little and you would cry a lot. And shortly thereafter, Allah sent down revelation to him to the effect of saying, why do you cause people to despair? They can always turn back to me. And that should be our image and ideal of Islam, that it is always an option to turn back. It is always good to turn back. And even people who turn back at the very end of their lives, that turning back, if done for the right reasons and intentions, will be, inshallah, accepted by Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our standing, our bowing, our prostrating. Those of us who are fasting on the day of Arafah, please accept that from us. And for those who have done Hajj, accept it from them. Ya Allah, forgive us our sins, the great ones and the small ones. Ya Allah, grant us the strength to overcome ourselves and give us full advantage of this month. Ya Allah, ease the burdens of all those who suffer. Grant them patience and contentment and do not make us arrogant towards others. Ya Allah, save us from the punishment of the grave, from the punishment of the hellfire, and give us the best of the world to come. Ya Allah, save us from deaths and depression, anxiety and all forms of insecurity. Make us peaceful and bring us peace. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adl wal ihsan wa ita'i dhul qurba wa yanha'i dhul fa'ashai wal munkari wal baghi ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon. Allah commands justice, doing good, and giving to kith and kin. He forbids all indecency, evil, and rebellion. He instructs you that you might receive admonition. Aqeemu salah, stand for the prayer.